Hi, welcome to the Ghostman Radio Station, and tonight my guest is Joyce Johnson, who wants me to start with No Woman, No Cry. 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 Because no no I can remember when we used to sit in Government Yard in Trenchtown, observing the hypocrites, mingle with the good people we met, good friends we have, oh, good friends we have lost. Along the way, in this great future, you can't forget your p- past. So dry your eyes, I say. No woman, no cry, no woman, no cry. Little darling, don't shed no tears. No woman, no cry. So I remember when we used to sit in the government yard in Trenchtown, when Georgie would make the fire lights, and I say, look, wood burning through the nights, when we'd cook cornmeal porridge, of which I share with you. My feet is my only carriage, and so I got to push on through. Oh, while I'm gone, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. No woman, no cry. No woman, no cry. I say, little darling, don't shed no tears. No woman, no cry. Mm. So beautiful. I guess um, Bob was there thinking about, you know, the memories that he had in this place. You know, about the kind of love that these people share together. And when he's talking about the woman, he's talking about the strength of you know, the mama or the mother, as called, you know, or the ladies, a woman, you know, they have a strong, they yeah, strong. Most, most people always say that black women are strong, but yes, many times they are very strong because they have to face so many things in life and they have to have a good background you know backbone as they says and the, you know more like a lion that's more what Bob Marley is trying to say you know she's a strong woman the man is there yes but most time they're not sitting, depending on a man but of course he's there to help and that is he talk about the the cornmeal you know, like they're sitting in love, talking about the the cornmeal. Cornmeal is kind of a a very um, yeah. a good Jamaican cereal that most damn people they have in the morning because uh, people think it's like a um, a blessed food. Mostly uh, uh, the Native American think it's a blessed food because in their ceremony when they have a festival, most of them they use it as a part of the ceremony that they celebrate the, the cornmeal with, you know, part of the festival. And then I can remember way back in the Bible when uh, there was a famine in Egypt and all the people depend on was like corn, the corn that they made just about everything from the corn. So I would say <laughs> uh, Bob there was sitting there thinking of the love that they have, they share those things together, the food, uh, you know, that one love that they have together. And so that little bit I have to say about, you know, the, the lyrics that you just saw. Uh, well, it's nice to get a bit of background because obviously um, I, I, anything I know about Jamaica is the cricket. <laughs> Yeah. As much as uh-huh. I, that's about that's my knowledge of Jamaica as far as it goes. So right. it's so nice to hear someone that's lived, built, born. You've um, obviously I'm going to do your bio now. If you don't know who Joyce Johnson is, she was born in Jamaica, West Indies, where she spent formative years and, live, and has lived in Canada for over fifty years, where she attended high school and college. After graduating from college, has a long successful career going at Dover Elevator, where she worked in a mainframe computer uh, operation and operator and uh, operation and programmer. Joyce studied creative writing at Singata College, Toronto, Canada. The years of living in Canada have awakened Joyce's conscience. She has been led by inner and outward influences to engage in social dialogue at a community level, to write about and share a wealth of knowledge developed in Canada, shaped in part by a Jamaican past. The first novel was called In Search of Happiness. Name was changed later. Later, I may, I, I, I think I may have said it's wrong. Name wrong eventually, but Hen- Henry Rettier, I probably said that wrong, is sequel and now complete after writing for many years. I also, she has also created another sequel novel called Writing 
waiting for the world to change. Joyce says, this is an exciting beginning of my writing career, because I do feel this is where my calling lies. The ETA, A Waiting for the World, was published, but decided to pull it and do some editing on the novels. Now, Joyce, what inspired you to write the book? Because, I, when I, I, as I said before the show, the show is, the book is very thought-provoking in certain ways of, of the subject, obviously. And I think, it, it, when people read it, I think they sense the strength that the woman has to cope with the situation she has to cope with. Right, yes. And first of all, I would say, it's not just uh, being a writer, but uh, more like, a, you know, a general, general multi- multitask. Like, for instance, um, I do acting, which I didn't mention in my bio. You know, I'm a performer, actor in the stage and also in the film. And I'm very passionate about doing whatever I do. So that's why, you know, like I multitask with many, many jobs. It, because, you know, usually when I do take on a certain job, I put my whole heart in it. Because, uh, you know, a matter of fact, the Bible says, whatever you find it, find it your hand to do, do it with all your heart. And I just put all my soul in whatever I do. And thinking about the, the stage that I have um, in last September, I just finished a stage in, um, in Venice in Italy. We were there for six weeks. We did a stage show. It's, uh, it is called The Right Way, directed by Daniel Bartonelli. Um, you know, and then we made it so happy that we made it in um, the New York Times. It so happy that they were there at the moment when we were there on stage during the pandemic. <laughs> so funny. But uh, yes, I did several jobs in film and acting and stage. Uh, many, many different little parts I've done, in, you know, on stage and in the movie. And, um, yes. So what else what were you saying about now? I was saying about yeah. the, the, the subject of your book is, yeah, okay. in one way, it's controversial because of the subject, but I like the fact it's controversial because these things do happen. And it has, yes. they were, you know, we can't deny it. You know? And I think the way you've done the book, you've, you've made sure the main character comes for it Stronger than she was when she w- first happened to her. Uh, uh, yes. You know, I could maybe read a bit of synopsis. Read the synopsis yes, there's yes, no, no problem. Please do. Okay. It all started in Toronto, Ontario, in a coffee shop on the south side corner of Church and King Street, right across from the Asian Church. A cathedral of St. James. Joanna White was having a difficult time in the office as well as her marriage. Her husband had recently walked out in her. Joanna is trying to restructure her life when she interrupted by a Jamaican woman, Henrietta Brown, who had just walked in, forcefully pulled the chair out, sitting down uh, next, uh, next to Joanna. She take a sip of coffee, then humming a song and tapping in rhythm close uh, by. Carefree nature, desperate to get out of her thought, Joanna asks Henrietta to join her. Henrietta agrees and quickly bond with Joanna while exchanging stories of pain, defeat, and abuse. From that day forward, they were inseparable making plans to continue sharing story as they explore Toronto and we had to continue in book two and book three. Under the cover of the same book is a novella called Waiting for the World to Change. In this book it speaks about marriage and domestic work. Susan Ottawa, a black lawyer in Toronto, Anita Kingsley, a domestic worker had met in the same building where they live. 
one day they were having lunch. Susan had a book, and she had just bought, and angrily she threw it on the table. It is called, Is Marriage for White People? On the, uh, she expressed to Anita, and she hasn't read it as yet, as she noticed Anita showing interest in reading it. The root of Susan's anger comes from knowing she's struggling to find a man from all the different find a man from all different walks of life are quickly to marry to white women before they thought a black woman crosses their mind. This made Anita laugh loudly as a typical Jamaican woman would. Anita threw a compassion to domestic work. As a college educated woman, she too found it very difficult to find a job outside domestic work. She finds herself asking this question, is domestic work just for black people? And it continued to book two and three. So it's, it's constantly these, you know, these women, our black women, are having difficulty. And back to Enrietta, which is uh, Joanna, she herself, she is uh, what you call a passing. Like she's passing to be white, which she is uh, black. She just a light, high skin, uh, white, uh, black woman. And uh, but anyhow, that is one of the reasons why Joe had left her because she was passing uh, to be a white woman, and they got married, and then she, they decide to have children. So she decide, you know, come clean to let him know that she really is uh, a white woman. Uh, so that's why Henriette and her find that bond, or are they bond together so, because they have so much in common to talk about. And um, Henrietta, uh, she had to take care of her grandchild, and with the grandchild went through many abuse at a early age. And um, yes. And later on, Joanna herself adopted a child who is black also and went through a lot of um, abuse herself. So they mm -hmm. have so much continually uh, interest. They have, you know, they both have interest. They share the same kind of interest. Now, how much, <laughs> how much of the book have you put a little bit of Jamaica in obviously I can hear a little bit of Jamaica in there and is there elements in the stories that are true but obviously you've made them more fictional for the book I, I no it's more factually than fiction it's a lot of facts there I imagine you had to do a fair bit of research I didn't have to do uh, very much research because the story, is, you know, it's the, it's there. It's a story that uh, I've experienced many of it, so it was, you know, very easy to write about. And obviously, being of Jamaican heritage, do you find that it was you could relate to the women more of the? I'm trying, it's not easy to say the right words, is it? Because I have to say it, coloured person. Because you never know what word to say now because you don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, well, the term I would say black, you know. Yeah, I, I didn't know whether I could or not, so. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. And, um, or you could say half American, uh, half Canadian American, or whatever. But anyhow, it was just all from Africa. And, um, yes. Uh, yes, I can, uh, yes, most of the stories, some of the stories, yeah, during the, what is happening into the black community. And what do you think of what the, I mean, obviously, we had the Black Life Matters uh, movement. I think it's still going stronger in America than it is the UK. Do you think? Yes. Do you think we we're beginning to 
change some people's thoughts or do you think there forever will be this for some reason hate one why somebody want, doesn't like someone just because of the colour of their skin I do I think it will continue but I think there's a bit of change I wouldn't say there's very much because living here in Canada for these many years in the early days, yes, I have, you know, come across a lot of discrimination, but it's gradually, you know, dying away. But I don't think it will go away forever. Is some people just have that thought that you're not the same as they, or some people are shocked. I remember the first time, I believe, uh, it was in the paper when there was a black person here in Toronto that they had was to give blood because they saw the man, white man, had a heart surgery. And it was a big thing in the paper. Things like that. Like, if you weren't human. Yeah, we've got a problem over here in in Britain at the moment that the black, Asian, and mixed... Uh, 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 mixed ethnic race people are not taking the vaccines because there's a, a mistrust or because uh, they I don't know why this is mistrust I, I don't fully understand it well I think it was mostly they were they, when there was hate and stuff like that they went to Africa and tested out the vaccine on the the black people, so that's why you know there is a mistrust. And to say, are they trying it out again? Because you notice that it's mostly a you know a pandemic. It's mostly black and Asian, whatever. Others is affect more uh, than other. Well, I would say white people. I, I I try to read a lot of old books, and there are some phrases that I've noticed in old books. Like some of them, I think, well, I can use that one just once, but beyond that, I don't really feel comfortable reading it. I probably say in the book it may contain words that are not appropriate for this day and age. And do you think that's the right thing to do? Do you think it's right? The book the words are still in the book. And would you like to change them? Or do you think we should keep them as they are and learn why people use those words? Well, if it can, um, I think if we're going to change, we have to change uh, the words that we used in the book. Because why if we're changing and not changing the words that will be used it does make sense there won't be any change and the younger generation will be coming up thinking or using the same words uh, so yes it should be changed the only thing I don't understand and this is probably because of a cultural thing I don't know um, when certain words is used in music uh, but if you said that certain word to you, I won't say it because I don't, it's offensive. But if I said that word, you, it, it would be considered offensive. I don't understand that. It just might be my ignorance. I, I put my hands up if it is. Yeah. Well, I guess people are getting awakened to realize, no, it's, it's ignorant to use a certain word. So then they decide, you know, we shouldn't really have it in music. So, which, yes, you know, I do agree. Because if, for instance, when they used to use the, well, I mean, they still use the N-word, and the comedians or whatever may use it as a black, black person would use it, it's all right, they feel good, but when a white person uses it, they, they use it in a different way. To say, you know, they won't, we won't accept it coming in from you, but our black person can say that to us and then we'll accept it. Yeah. I, 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 that's why I like having debates because it brings it up. I mean, people say, oh, you can't mention it. I said, well, no, I haven't said the word. I'm just saying <laughs> the emphasis, you know, I, I wouldn't say it because I, I'm very careful how I say things now because. It makes you think more what you should be saying. 
because that's a good thing really in one way but it can be a bad thing in another way because uh, say a policeman comes along and sees a crime and he knows that it's that person but if that person is of a certain colour then that cr- then they're going to be a bit wary of questioning him because I know in in America well basically if you're coloured you the, the police sort of like don't trust you from day one sort of thing I, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not it just comes across like that well it is too uh, that's why most uh, American women they, ha- they start teaching their children from early to say, okay, what they need to be aware of and please stab you or whatever. And it, it's not just happening in America, but also in Canada. D- well, because... Uh, do you, with Canada, do you, do you like the fact that the Queen is still technically your monarch? Yeah, that's all right. I have no problem. Because I know some Commonwealth countries are sort of saying, oh, well, we don't want those monarch, but we don't mind still being part of the Commonwealth. Yeah, uh, yes, I know people don't like that, but to me, I don't mind. Although Commonwealth as a, as a, a structure is probably not, I mean, basically we colonise these countries not very nicely. And we did treat some people not very nicely, like all empires do. You know, whatever empire you look at, there's always a bad part in every history, Canada, America, wherever you go. And I I think we try to learn from that. Have you, when you write in your books about that, do do you include some injustices? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, Like, for instance, waiting uh, for the world to change... Uh, there was an example of um, Susan, she's a lawyer, and, and she always talked to me to discuss the, the problem that happened in the office. When she goes and there was this um, Jewish man, she was a, well, you know, this white woman came in and she was pregnant, and she was in boardroom, Anita, uh, not Anita, Susan was in the boardroom, and she had a client. So this white pregnant white woman came in and she asked Susan if she could go to another boardroom or the office because she wanted to use the boardroom. So Susan, uh, you know, more, more, um, she'd been at the company for a very long time and this is a new, uh, new lawyer. And um, she didn't like how she spoke to her. And then she went to her boss, which her boss was a Jewish man. And she went, she went into the office. There he was, he, he, the Jewish her boss had his feet up on the desk. And as she walked in, he did, still didn't remove his feet off the desk. And Susan explained what had happened. And he just says, oh, well, you just have to suck it up because black people been treated like like this all the time or wherever you go so just suck it up you see he didn't say okay well I'm sorry let me go and talk to her about it because she's a senior Susan is a senior and she she also the white woman have her own office she could have gone to her office but why she comes to demand uh, the space there when Susan is using it with her client. So, as a matter of fact, the case is in court now. Not just that, but many uh, discriminations she had, uh, had happened since she'd been on the job. And it's not just on her job, but when she was going to university, she'd been bombarded by many of the students. How did you afford? Did your parents support? Did you get a student loan? And there was a few black students that been in the, uh, was at the university, and one, many of them quit. There was one, she and uh, um, had uh, high blood pressure and she was paralyzed on one side she had to leave because of all the stress that she'd been going through so there's many many things that you know it's not out there that people haven't seen and heard and it, I remember in school myself when we did my high school here and I raised my hand and my hand is up for the longest while and the teacher wouldn't uh, you know uh 
asked me to question them and answer the question. Then, and after a while, a white person, and then she was, she did um, reply, your house is still in room. And, uh, but then she, when there's no one else, then they'll turn around and ask the black person. But then, anyhow, you know, she did that to me. That relaxed me. So th- these are all the things that we have to constantly go into. And, uh, yes. So where we go, as I said, as the lawyer said to Susan, that, you know, you know black people have been treated like this all the time. She, she should just suck it up. So just constantly like that. Like as I said, I was in Italy um, the other day and I was surprised in September of last year. Surprised the difference between there because I've lived in New York City and also here in Toronto, Montreal. And I noticed the blacks, they've been treated much, much different, you know. And at first they had been a problem there, but things have become more like normal now. So yes, things can be changed here in America. Uh, but the Italian people tend to welcome black a lot. And even in Canada, I noticed that. Yes, I noticed that very much. Too. Now tell me a little bit about the how you found the writing process. Because did you self-publish or did you go for a publisher? I did a self-publish, but I'm looking for a traditional publisher. You never know, somebody may listen into the podcast and <laughs> may think, oh, yeah. that, that, book, that, that sounds a good book, which I, I will. As I said, I have read it and I have recommended it. I, I found it very powerful. I generally did find it very powerful. And I I, I could see where he was going and I liked the, the, the style of the writing. And it's always important. If you grab somebody by probably the first two chapters, you normally yes. got the reader involved in your story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, you know, like me. Yes, yes. Because I write deep from my heart. I write with passion, uh, and, you know, because, yeah, I kind of like to empty my heart out, you know, pour my heart out. And I was happy when I started which I started many years ago. I started with the typewriter and because I was so filled with anger and everything. And when I started, I didn't, my fingers didn't let up for a while until practically my mouth was empty, you know, with the things that I had to say in the paper. And my finger was just walking, walking in the typewriter so much because and banging is, you know, how the whole typewriter, you have to press very hard and build, the bell sounds. Uh, but yes, and uh, from then on, I just constantly write in because I just have to, because many things uh, walk in on, or on the, the, the public transportation, the train or the streetcar, I've seen so many things. I just want to just write it out in paper. So that's why I said it's mostly factual that I write uh, well, a big fiction because there's so much to write about that, you know, I just have to write it on paper. And obviously you mentioned earlier about your um, performing career. Where can people, oh, yes. where can people see you? Have you got well, anything on YouTube or audio or anything like that? Well, yes, I do. Yes, you can see on YouTube some of the work that I've did. Yes, uh, it, um, yeah, yes. Uh, as I said, I was in Europe in 2020 September, and as a matter of fact, the, the, I told you the Toronto Star, and not the Toronto Star, uh, the New York Times. They were there, so um, yes, uh, they can find on um, YouTube it's the right way it's called the right way directed by Daniele Bartonelli do you do you, and, um, in, do you enjoy performing because it, it's a, it's an art form getting on the stage isn't it pardon me it's very it can be very nervous getting on the stage well no I just get into character <laughs> and I just don't feel nervous I just go and just do what I need to do, I'm just thinking about that I'm in that character. I am that person. 
and I just do it. So I don't feel nervous. I just go in it. And, you know, I love a drama. I love to cry. I love, you know, I just love. So when I get there, I'm prepared. I know what I'm just do it and get off there. Yes. Would you like uh, someone like Netflix or Amazon to come along and say, oh, we'd like to do a, a mini little series based on your book? Obviously, when they do it, when they have to do a book, they may have to condense it a little bit because, obviously, as you know, television and books don't always. Some things you can put in a book, some things you can't put on television. Would you mind if they changed it a little bit, as long as they consult oh, you? No. Oh no, I wouldn't. Um, sometimes you have no choice. If they like the title, they are because. Uh, guess who's coming for dinner with Sidney Poitier and the person who wrote it he said uh, uh, the movie pre- uh, director invited him on the set you know after they bought the, he, he sold the rights to them and then they just rearranged it because when they invited him on the set to see when they were filming the movie and he said he didn't even recognize half of what he had wrote and even the song they had changed it there that he had, you know, I guess, for the the movie. So I'm saying that if they like the title or they like something, they're going to do what they know that sells. So, no, I don't mind them, you know, doing uh, what they need to do. And by the way, I was on, um, in, in the 80s, there was this show named Night Heat that was a Toronto base. I used to be a policewoman at that show. From 80 to 89, when the show went off. Wow. Really, yeah, claim to fame, eh? <laughs> yeah? Your claim to yes, fame. Close. Yes, and Hoover versus Kennedy. That was a civil wa- a civil rights movement. Lena Horne, Al- Ari Belafanti. Uh, my name was Lorraine Hansberry in that show. It was that movie. That was an American, and I also was in this movie, um, a 1944 movie, Anne Rice. Her book become it was a slavery uh, movie, and her book, um, you know, they adopted into a movie. So I I was in Hamilton um, for two weeks filming that um, uh, the, the the show. And there were several, you know, actors was in that. <laughs> I get to meet Ben Vereen, you know, he was in the, the slave movie there, Roots. Uh, yes. So it was, you know, it's, it's really good. I love meeting, <laughs> you know, I love that kind of, a bit of, I would say, excitement or whatever. Yeah, but it's still so different because, you know, you get away from yourself. And get into a different character, and it just make you feel that even if it's for a day, you're that person. <laughs> it's you know, I forget about your whole life and just be another person. Well, please mention where people can find your book, Joyce. Oh, they can find it at Amazon.com, and it's Joyce M. Johnson. And the name of the book is Henrietta, H-E-N-R-I-E-T-H-A, and Waiting for the World to Change. Uh, as I said before, they're on the one cover. Well, I like the picture you chose on the cover. Yeah. Very, yeah. very appropriate. I imagine that's supposed yeah. to, I presume it's you looking out into the ocean. No, it was me. It was the old picture, old family picture. It, that was many people thought it's me, but it was me. And it's um, it, it's also have the the Statue of Liberty and also CN Tower. And uh, there is it anyway, just standing on the beach looking out. <laughs> I guess she's looking towards Canada and looking towards America, liberty, you know, freedom. <laughs> I do like the picture. It's very evocative of, of the book as well yeah yeah have you ever done your book in a um audio fashion you know like an audio version of your book uh yes i 
I did, I have it, uh, no, I promised us to do it, but I didn't get to it, but I have it been read on a radio st uh, station for about three months, yeah, three months I had it read on, uh, Clifton had read a uh, radio on Facebook. That's cool. But then I... Yes, what I wanted was to be an audience, but I didn't get to it. But I did a play I adopted, and we had turned to a stage play, and I had it an audience. Uh, yeah, I did the stage play an audience. Yes, because it, 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 people think it's easy to do a stage play of your own book, but I've just started to do it, and it's quite hard, yeah. isn't it? Because you're thinking... What would that person have said? Because obviously there may be bits where he wasn't around at the time. So you've got to think, presume what they may have said. Yeah, but I didn't find it very difficult to do. And when I did the play, which is about hmm, 10, 15 years ago, many people thought it should be a movie. Because the actor who did Henrietta did an extreme good job, extreme good job there, especially they love the the um, the grave um, scene where Henrietta she was abused. Her mother passed on when she was seven years old, and she grew up with her grandmother, and um, she went through a lot of abuse. So she went to the grave side to talk to her mother one day when she went to lunch. So that was a very emotional part that many of the audience uh, was connected to. And they all thought it should be, you know, a movie. And well, yes, they should all thought it would you know, do very well. And also, Ruthie in, um, Ruthie in Amy Atosh also, she went through a lot of abuse with uh, matter of fact, with her stepdad and also with her biological father also too. And that was a very deep one, I find it's very deep. And, uh, yes. Well, uh, Joyce, I, um, I always ask my guests the following question. Joyce, what is your unique sign-off? I would say, you know, it would be nice to, as Bob Marley's song says, about one love, you know, to, for people to kind of get together and have compassion for each other. You know, seeing each other, not for the color of your skin, but to see what they have to offer. And here's each mine other. to you, you, Joyce. I talked to Joyce M. Johnson today. Who's... Who likes Bob Marley's No Woman No Cry? Because it relates to a Jamaican past and how the women should be strong in this world to be able to talk and say their feelings and words. She does some singing and some acting. And you may see her sometime and look her up. But please look up her book, Hen Henrietta, and Waiting for the World to Change. It's powerful, worthwhile, and you'll know how strong a woman can be in the elements of life's journey and how it can throw you some curveballs, but at the end of the day, if you're strong enough, you can always come for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think Joyce will agree, there's nothing wrong with being a strong woman, because every man needs a woman behind him. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. But one thing I wanted to discuss with you, if you have a few more minutes, yep. is Bobby's, Bobby's song that you have on the show before. I re I was listening to the link that that you have there about that he, he you know, he's very spiritual or whatever, and he he like you know he uh, he can see ghosts or he does spiritual about the. You know the Bible and what that you've seen uh, so many things. You remember that story? Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Yes, I can identify with him very, very much with all that spiritual thing because 
I myself can see ghosts and I, I was so connected with him <laughs> when I was listening to it and I strongly believe in a lot of stuff that he had said because many times we judge but we don't know we are the, per the person because we all have gifts and some, some people are gifted for certain things because even for instance way back in the Bible like when the king was uh, a dreamt a dream and he didn't know the meaning for it. So he called for all these magicians and sorcerers and all that. So those are the gifts that they have that they can tell uh, what a person, future, you know, astrology, you know, they know, they, you know, they got that gift, that special gift. So, because I noticed you weren't sure about uh, when Bobby was talking, you weren't sure how much to absorb or, or what to believe in that, but I'm saying, you know. Yeah, I try to be open because obviously being the presenter, sometimes you've got to be open to ideas. Right. And I think it's always best to, if I don't understand something, I'd rather be honest about it than be one of these right. people that lie and say, oh yes, I fully understand, but I really don't. Yeah. Yes, you have to be there, you know, uh, get that experience before really you can really believe. But it's kind of hard. Many people say, oh, I know, I, do, I can't see ghosts because there's not such thing when you're dead, you're dead. But, um, yes, I do believe in some of the things that he was saying. That's good. I'm glad you enjoyed that because, as I say, yeah. I did mention that I had, had a... Um, near death experience mine was more right. off, more audio which I heard right. a woman's voice telling me to wake up when I was in my coma and I've not heard that woman's voice before or since I seriously believed it was my guardian angel I know there's lots of theories out there about your brain playing tricks the drugs you're on and all that but that's where my name ghost man comes from because whereas I was in my coma I was never in I was neither in the real world or the next so therefore I was a ghost. So that's where that comes from. Yeah, but but sometimes the angel or God can come and reveal things to you. Because I remember once I was in Montreal and I was going through so many heartache with my sister and all the people. And I remember always have my King James Bible before, beside me on the bed. But I never remember memorizing Psalms 25. And that night I went to bed and I was sleeping. All of a sudden I woke up saying, Unto the old Lord do I trust. Oh, I trust you, know, let me not be ashamed. Let not the enemy triumph over me. Yeah, let none that wait and be ashamed. Let them be ashamed but transgress their cause. And I constantly say it until the end. And at the end I say Psalms 25. Just like the the um, the angel or the spirit, late in my spirit, I was just saying the words. I got up with my lips and saying the words. And when I picked up the Bible beside me, I can believe that those were all the words that were I was saying. Was I just couldn't? And every time something happened, or I feel depressed, I'll get up and I start to do after the oh Lord, watch. Oh Lord, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. And I'm just constantly saying that it makes me feel better after I say. It. So yes, that lady, that person that was calling you. So sometimes these things you you can't explain. You know what happened or how these things happen. But yes, that person maybe will call you from. Don't go. Do you know to stay because I've seen things like that happen in the movie he says no it's not your time go go back go back yes people can have those experiences because I said you know with that experience from Psalms 25 I've known Psalms 23 you know the Lord's my shepherd I know that memorize it but I've never memorized 25 and 25 is like to say whenever the enemies come around me I should just repeat that and for some reason, I, that can never leave my mind. I'm constantly saying it when something goes wrong, out, and I get that comfort. So yes, I do believe what you're saying. You can hear these voices, or just like Bobby, what he said, he spoke to ghosts or whatever happened. 
or Jesus himself or whatever. Yes, I do, you know, can identify with, with many things that he had said. Good, thank you for that, Joyce. And that will be...